Hey there, I'm the GD&T guy, self-proclaimed, and you are at the very beginning of a deep dive into a somewhat niche topic in the world of mechanical design, engineering drawings, and geometric dimensioning and tolerancing. That's the GD&T. If you like what you hear, please like and subscribe so you get the rest of these videos in your feed. And please also comment with your agreements and disagreements and help me identify any mistakes I make. I will post a link to where you can find PDFs of all the drawings I discuss so you can pause and go and look at them yourself. Now, despite being somewhat niche, I believe there's a lot of interest in this topic, and so this discussion has the potential to help a great deal. Okay, let's go. This is a stripped down illustration of a very popular method for locating parts. Have a look at this gray part. Imagine this is just a detail area of a larger machined part. It's made of aluminum. There are two steel dowel pins pressed into tight fitting holes. There are also four threaded holes. The dowel pins in the gray part locate this blue part that has a corresponding hole and a slot feature that will fit closely over the pins. There are screw clearance holes, and then there are fasteners to hold the assembly together. One thing that makes this so satisfying is that the blue part is elegantly constrained in exactly six degrees of freedom. And when this is done nicely, it can be just terrific. Maybe you have handled some parts like this in which if there is any play, it's just imperceptible. There's nothing like it. A little while ago, I posted a video about a part I called a pedestal, which has some interfaces like this. But I think this topic deserves some more attention, and that's what I'm going to try to do with this series of videos. Now, it's been said that I am anti dowel pin. Me? No. I'm for the judicious use of dowel pins. Because here's what I've seen. To get this fit to be the terrific fit you're probably looking for, a lot has to go right. It is highly reliant on tight machining tolerances that are expensive, unreliable, and difficult to inspect. If you've had good experiences with this fit, you've probably also had bad experiences where it wouldn't go together or it wouldn't come apart again. That's the worst. I would also say that even though this interface is popular, has great kinematics, and works well with the GD&T system, the dimensioning and tolerancing is not elementary, as you will see. If you are done with the bad fits and the struggle with the drawings, you need to learn this tolerancing. I think it's going to make a lot of sense to any mechanical engineer, designer, or machinist. So let's just start by reminding ourselves what we love about these dowel pins. The steel of the dowel pins is hard and wear resistant for repeated assembly. They can be very precise in their diameter, even these cheap mil spec 16555 dowel pins are ground to a diameter limit of two tenths of one thousandth of an inch. This precision makes it possible to size holes for interference fits and for close clearance fits. The dowel pins could help prevent the parts from shifting under side loads and have a high shear strength. They can be employed as part of a poke yoke strategy in which there's only one way for manufacturing to put this assembly together. That's the idea behind the way I have the pins offset from the center here. That's good stuff. So, should we put dowel pins in every interface? I would just urge you to moderation. At the end of these videos, let's see if you're using them more or less. At the very least, they're an additional process step of pressing in the pins after the part has been machined and maybe even anodized or plated. That process is non-trivial and it has to be right. The crookedness of the pins is a big factor in this fit. And really, every additional process and every tight tolerance should be justified by the requirements of the assembly so we're not wasting resources. To utilize the precision of the dowel pins requires similarly precise machining, which means tight tolerances. And tight tolerances mean that it's harder to get bids on our parts, and we're going to get high prices quoted from our suppliers because they're going to see the job as risky. Now, look, you could increase the size of this hole and the slot and loosen the tolerances to the point where they are a slam dunk in the machine shop. As you increase these sizes, you're going to have more allowance in the joint. Is this something you can live with? If no, I would point you to a fundamental limitation of this interface, which is that it is still, by definition, an interface with some allowance just to get clearance over these pins. But there's another limitation of these dial pins that's harder to understand, and probably leads to their overuse in industry. Stems from this, the dowel pins have one very precise feature, their diameter, but they do not magically confer that precision onto every part that they touch. 
Let me illustrate this with a quasi-plausible example from my days of lasers and optical layouts. This should show some of what the dial pins can do and also what might be asking too much of them. Now this part is a monolithic mirror and mount that can be used to bounce a laser beam and steer it off in a different direction. You can see that this is machined out of a solid piece of metal and this reflective surface could be made by some special process. Now I had to make some changes to the earlier example so that the laser people don't attack me. So now we have three mounting holes and this relief in between them. But other than that, this interface should look familiar from earlier with the hole and the slot locating on the dial pins of the mounting interface detail. Let's zoom out and see how this looks in a larger optical system. Try to imagine that gray part as being on the scale of this entire screen here. Now this is the center ray of a laser beam coming in from the bottom. It's just perfectly on this vector here. The beam hits the mirror and reflects off towards a fixed aperture on the upper left. This is a plate with a hole in it, the same diameter as the laser beam. Now, will the laser beam go through the aperture? We designed everything in CAD so it would, and we're using dowel pins. But consider me an extreme skeptic on this one. For this to work, everything would have to be perfect. On the gray part, any deviation in the orientation of this flat surface or in the position of the pins is going to steer the beam away from that aperture. And we're talking about the position of the pins within this large part related to other datums elsewhere on the part, which makes it even more challenging. Then in the mirror itself, using the three coplanar surfaces, the hole and the slot as datum features, you would likely need tight orientation and probably positional control on the mirror surface. And then the temptation is probably going to be to crank down the hole and the slot sizes and tolerances. So these two parts are going to be tight tolerances galore. And still, can it ever be good enough? You can do the trigonometry and come up with a tolerance budget. But what if that budget is zero and you have to divide it 10 ways? Say we decide to ignore all of that. We order the parts anyway. We put them all together and we're clipping the laser on the aperture. Now these dial pins that once promised us so much precision are locking us into a bad alignment. So the next thing is we'll be down in the machine shop asking for the hole and slot to be opened up. We're yanking out the pins. We're putting in shims. We're trying anything to get it to work. How about another approach? This one's an adjustable mirror. It sits on the same interface as the fixed mirror, but for this one, I'm hinting at a tip tilt mechanism with these pivot features. Let's think about this one in the larger system. The incoming laser beam hits our reflective surface and steers off towards the aperture. Does it clear the aperture? Probably not. So we tip and tilt the mechanism until we're right on target and then we lock it all in. One of the big winners from this has got to be that gray part. Now the orientation of this flat surface shouldn't be nearly so critical and we should be able to dial back the position tolerance on those pins quite a bit. Which is good because I'll tell you, it's one thing to call it a tolerance limit of two thousandths or even one thousandths on the width of a small slot or on the diameter size of the hole. But it is not reasonable to call out one or two thousandths as a position tolerance for dowel pins in a large part. My adjustable mirror solution comes at some cost. I've definitely added more piece parts and I've even made an assembly out of this. It is not the rock solid brick that this earlier example was either. Trade offs. I think we can say that the position tolerances on these pins in that large part are the major factor in the initial pointing accuracy for this mirror. And it has less to do with the dowel pins themselves and more to do with how precisely your milling machine can locate them. But there's another thing this interface does that you ought to consider, which is that it provides some repeatability. Let's say we need to turn off the laser, remove this mirror for a minute, do some work, and then we're going to put the mirror mount back on again and fire up the laser again. Does the laser beam stay on the aperture? This is the repeatability of the interface. The repeatability is mostly a result of the clearance between the pins and these locating features. The locations of the pins in the larger part don't really figure into it. Closer repeatability means tighter tolerances, and you should only apply tolerances that can be achieved reliably. If you cross that line, and it would still not be repeatable enough, you might need a different kind of interface. Now look, 
Both the fixed mirror and the adjustable mirror have the same repeatability, same hole, same slot. The difference, I guess, is that the reflected beam from the adjustable mirror is going to repeat, with some clearance on the pins, to the aperture. And the beam from the fixed mirror will repeat to wherever it was in the first place, probably clipping on the aperture. So in conclusion, maybe we can say about this interface that it can offer good repeatability depending on your machining tolerances. But that initial positioning accuracy of the one part onto the larger part, or within some system, that all happens in the position tolerances we apply to the pins in the larger part. Finally, this appears like it could be just one interface of many on the larger part. And each one of these represents an opportunity for failure. Your ideal is for every feature, every dial pin to be a slam dunk down in the machine shop and in the inspection room and still have a design that meets its functional requirements. Okay, we're off to a good start with video one, but we've hardly even talked about the drawings or the dimensioning or intolerance and callouts. That's all to come. We're building up to it. See you on video two. This is the GDNT guy signing out.